Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that we are all able to make it here safely today. It's cold, we're under a a roof, we're warm, we're comfortable. You've provided for us food and water and everything that we need. And we just pray that today this word of yours will go out among us and it will be effective in our lives. It is in Christ's name we pray this. Amen. Good morning. It is a blessing to be saved. It's Christmas. It's Christ's birth. And that's why we celebrated Christmas. What a gift that was. And that gift keeps on going. It keeps on going throughout our lives, throughout our sanctification as Christians. How many of you today are absolutely, absolutely happy, pleased, excited that Christ has died for your sins? Amen. Amen. That's no small thing. That's no small thing. Don't sit there too comfortable and too relaxed thinking it's not a big deal that Christ has died for your sins. That's a very big deal. It's bigger than any present you ever got for Christmas. It's bigger than your car out there, your house, and every single thing you have. You have life eternal. That's something to be excited about. That's what we call assurance. That's what we call assurance. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Assurance. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Blessed assurance. Your question should be, How can I be assured when there's bad things going on? How can I be assured when this happened or that happened? How can I have assurance in this crazy world? That's the question you should ask yourself throughout this sermon. Why don't we all turn our pages to 2 Peter? Peter's going to answer that question, how to have assurance. It's not through presence It's not through treating yourself with something special. By far, that's not assurance. It's not by getting a pat on the back by your pastor or your elder or your deacon or your friend. It's not by hearing the right song in the congregation. That's not how we have assurance. But first, let's start with Peter's first letter. His first letter was concerned with believers who were scattered throughout Asia Minor. They were being persecuted. So he was strengthening them. He was giving them assurance through God's word. This second letter of Peter's was to the same believers in Asia Minor. He sought to strengthen them with false teachers being in the church. We talked about this before a few weeks ago. There was false teachers amongst the people. They were discrediting God's word. They were causing dissension among the people. And so Peter's message was to strengthen them in the time of infiltration of false teachers. In 2 Peter chapter 1, Verse 19 and 21, we see. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Peter is saying this is true prophecy. This is the true word of God. He starts by telling them what the true word of God is. And then uh, further down here, in uh, chapter 2, verse 1, it says, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, 
bringing swift destruction upon themselves. So we see true prophecy in the church, and then there were false teachers. And then down in verse 13 and 14, we see that they introduced deception, and they were enticing the people. They introduced deception, and they were enticing the people. Verse 13, suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong, they counted a pleasure to revel in the daytime. Their stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you, having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, accursed children. The false teachers were there. They were present among the true teaching of God. So this was a greater danger, the false teachers. We face that today on a grand scale, false teaching. The outline of this section that we're going to go over today, well, first of all, this section covers chapter 1, verse 8 through 11. That's what we're going to cover today, chapter 1, verse 8 through 11 of Second Peter. But just to give you a little outline, verses 1 through 2 is a general greeting from Peter to believers. This letter was written to believers. Verses three through four is, talks about God, God's enabling grace that allows us to do the right thing that's given through the gospel. Verses five through seven talks about the practical, the practical result of the Holy Spirit's indwelling the believer. The practical results, the fruits of the Spirit. So first, God enables the believer, and then the believer should act on that enablement. And then in verse 8, we talk about possessing the fruits of the Spirit. Possessing the fruits of the Spirit. And then in verse 9, lacking the fruits of the Spirit. What happens when we lack the fruits of the Spirit? And lastly, verse 10 through 11, encouragement to practice the fruits of the Spirit. Of the Spirit. So let's start in verse 8, and we'll read through verse 11. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Abundantly supplied to you. So, we're talking about the fruits of the Spirit here, the fruits of the Spirit. When he says, for if these qualities are yours. If you go back to verse 5, verse 5, it says, Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply. So the following things are the fruits that he's talking about. The things that he's saying here are qualities. He talks about moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. And in your self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. And in your brotherly kindness, love. Those are just a portion of the fruits of the Spirit. Just a portion. And he is saying here, Peter is saying, if these things, if they are yours, if they belong to you, if you possess them, if they are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful. Neither useless nor unfruitful. So your question to yourself should be, how can I do these things? You can't do it on your own. You cannot do it on your own. Who can do these things? a person that is indwelt with the Holy Spirit. How do I become indwelt with the Holy Spirit? By believing in the Holy One, God Almighty. So, in reverse, if you believe in the Holy One, God Almighty, guess what happens? 
you will do these things. If you're changed on the inside, you will act it out on the outside. So if these qualities are yours, that word are is a big word. It means a continuous action. If they're constantly yours, if they belong to you, if you possess them, if they are yours, if you continue to possess these qualities, well, how can you possess these qualities, you say? How can you prove that to me? Well, in verse 3, it says so. Seeing that his divine power, his divine power has granted to us, his divine power to us, has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. That's how we possess it. Because it's by his divine power that he has granted us the ability to possess those things. He's given them to us. That's how they belong to you. That's a beautiful thing. That's a gift. And we talked about last two weeks ago about the gift of faith. It's given to us by God. But he doesn't just leave it there if you possess these things. He doesn't leave it there. He says, if you possess these things and are increasing, if those things are increasing in your life, not a stagnant thing. He says, if you possess them and they're increasing, what does it mean to be increasing? We all know what that means. It's very simple. Do more. <laughs> Do more. A continuous action again. This word, they're both participles. It means that it's a continuous thing. It's something you should always be doing. You should continuously possess these things. And you should continuously be increasing. Increasing. Not a stagnant thing. How do you do that? Obviously by his ability. We read about that in verse 3 and 4. It's by his great power. Well, what's your side of it? What's your side of it? That's right, there's a side of it for you. It's not a, hey, I'm saved. I'm good to go. I can go about my life now and everything's good. No, there's your side of it. What do you need to do? You need to continue to receive it by reading and practicing his word. By reading and practicing his word. He's given you his ability to understand this word through the spirit. He's given you his word that inspired the, spirit, the, the scripture itself. Now you need to read it and act on it. That's how you do it. So, do you possess it? Are you increasing in the fruits of the Spirit? Do you possess them? Are you increasing? Because if you are, you are neither useless or unfruitful. If you are, you are neither useless or unfruitful. So, first of all, it says it renders you neither useless or unfruitful. That means to, to designate you, to declare you, to establish you as this certain thing. You are established as neither useless or unfruitful if you uh, do these things. If you're, if you're increasing by these things. You're designated as neither useless or unfruitful. Useless talks about being ineffective. Thoughtless, brainless, brain dead. You're just sitting there empty. <laughs> you don't want to be that way, amen? amen? Laziness, idleness. Who wants to do that? Anyone ever work with someone like that? How does that feel? <laughs> you don't want to be useless. Who wants to be useless? How about unfruitful, unproductive, barren? You don't even produce any fruit. And that's what we're talking about, fruit. Fruit, producing fruit. So if you practice these things, if you possess them and you're increasing, you won't be useless and unfruitful. Well, in the opposite way, what we can say is, if you do practice these things, you will be useful and fruitful. Right? Amen? 
How many people say they're Christians and they're not fruitful or useful? Now, is that possible to be a Christian in that way? Yes, people can backslide, of course. Absolutely. Who wants to be a backslider? If you're backsliding today, I encourage you to go forward. Stop. Be encouraged today to be fruitful and useful. And remember how I said you do that, by reading and practicing the word. I'll get into more of that practicing later. But by reading and practicing the word. God's given you that ability. James chapter 2 verse 20 says, faith without works is? Another word for that in the Greek is useless. Faith without works is useless. Dead. So don't go around telling all your friends you're a Christian if you don't do anything about it. That's dead. That's useless. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 10, or chapter 3. And we're going to hear what John the Baptist has to say. And later we're going to see what Jesus has to say about producing fruit. Matthew chapter 3, verse 10. Now, John the Baptist was talking about the religious elite when he said this, but it applies to us all. He says, The axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward. Now let's flip over to Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Now that was John the Baptist's words. This is Jesus' words. Chapter 7, verse 15. Beware of the false prophets. Now remember, and Peter, what was he dealing with? False prophets. This is after this time that Jesus was saying this. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. <laughs> How do you know them? By their fruit. That's why Peter is talking about the fruits. He's dealing with false teachers. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? It's a lot of common sense there, isn't it? So, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Man, Jesus was a true theologian. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. There's a result again, fire. Anybody here don't believe in hell? Talk about fire twice here. So then you will know them by their what? By their fruit. Pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward. Let's go over to, to Galatians chapter 5, and we'll see more evidence of the fruit. Galatians chapter 5. We all know this. We could all well, almost recite it. But the key is, do you do them? Who cares if you know them? Do them. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Just in case you're wondering what these fruits are, other than the ones listed in Peter. Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's the fruits of the Spirit. Those are more of them. It's more of the list that Peter was talking about. That's what Peter's talking about. Now let's go back to 2 Peter. And remember, the fruits that Peter's talking about when he says these qualities, if you practice them and they increase, are listed in verses 5 through 7. There's a lot of things listed here. And even in Galatians and in Peter, it's not all-inclusive all even. <laughs> There's many more. 
We could sit here all day and talk about the fruits of the Spirit. But I would go so far to say that love is the most important. Love. It covers everything. Just remember love. Are you loving others? Where does the fruit come from? Does it come from yourself? Are you just a good old person? I'm a good person. I'm not so bad. Where does it come from? From the indwelling spirit, like we said before. It can only be carried out by those who are indwelt by the spirit and who are born again. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again to see the kingdom. You must be a new person. But with that comes fruits. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter five. Verse 17. This is beautiful. Therefore, if anyone, if if anyone is in Christ, so if you're saying you're a Christian, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. <laughs> new. New. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Pretty straightforward, right? Brand new. Don't make excuses about being your old self. Move forward. (laughs) Brand new. New creatures in Christ. If God remade you a new person, and he's ultimately powerful, how can you say, I can't help it. I'm still my old self. Get over it. (laughs) That's possessing the fruits. Let's go back to 2 Peter. That's possessing the fruits. Now we're going to talk about lacking the fruits. But before we talk about that, I want to add one little thing here where it says here at the end. In the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, if they're increasing, if you possess them, they leave you neither unfruitful or useless in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this has been talked about in in verse 2, where it says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. And then in verse 5, now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge. So we've talked about knowledge here before. It's that precise, correct knowledge of God. It's the true knowledge of God versus the faulty knowledge of God. How many people say, I know who Jesus is. I know who he is. But do you really have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you really know him? Jesus said this famous thing. He says, depart from me, I never what? Knew you. Mary had not yet known, or I'm sorry, Joseph had not yet known Mary. Well, some versions say that he kept her a virgin, but it says no. So this knowing is a relationship. It's intimately knowing someone. And in this case, it's saying in the true knowledge. And the reason he's saying in the true knowledge is because how many false professors were saying that they knew Christ? They didn't know him. They didn't have a relationship with him. That's why it's saying in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the way, is our Lord, Master. So in the true knowledge, what does true knowledge result in? Repentance and faith. Repentance and faith. Because if you truly know Christ, you knew the price that he had to pay on the cross. What will that make you do? Go to your knees in prayer and repentance and turning away from your sin. Hating your sin. Loving Christ. Following him because you love him. Raise your hand if you love Christ. Absolutely. Then do something about it. 
That's the true knowledge, repentance and faith. On the one hand, you turn away from your sins. On the other hand, you follow Christ. You can't have one without the other. You can't have faith without repentance. If you didn't turn away from your sins, how are you going to have faith? He's the Lord. He's the master. He's the one who called us by his own glory and excellence. He is our master. So that's what it means by if you possess these things, if you have them and are increasing. But on the other hand, for he who lacks these things in verse 9, he who lacks these qualities... Now, those are the things in verse 5 through 7. He who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. You see the opposition here? One possesses the qualities of verses 5 through 7, the fruits of the Spirit, and one lacks these qualities. Now, there's a shift here in this sentence. There's a shift. When it says, for he, for the first time in this section it's introduced as a third person. Everything before that is second person. In verse um, five, where it says supply, that verb is uh, second person. It's saying you supply. And all throughout this section, it's talking about you, 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 you. It's second person. And then in this verse, it switches to third person for he, he. It's showing you that this is a different person. This is a different type of person than the person who supplies these things, then the person who has these things and these things are increasing. It's the opposite. It's a person who lacks these qualities. Like I said before, could it be someone who is backsliding? Yes, it could be. But here's a warning if you're backsliding. Could you backslide your way all the way to hell? (laughs) So if you live your whole life in a condition, that's not backsliding. Your whole life is in one condition, that's not backsliding. Backsliding is backsliding, you get back on your feet later. So, he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted. Now, all throughout Scripture, we talk about the blind. The blind is talked about all throughout Scripture. And you know that it's referring more to the spiritually blind, the spiritually blind. So it says, he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted. So this word lacking means to not possess. The person who does not possess. It's literally the opposite of the word used in uh, verse 8. If these qualities are yours. And this one is the opposite. It says, for he who lacks these qualities. It literally means, for he who does not possess these qualities. For he who does not possess these qualities, he's blind. He's blind. It's describing the person who doesn't possess the qualities. Blind is an adjective here. It's saying he's blind. He's blind. Now in the NASB it says, or short-sighted. That's not there in the the Greek. It just says blind, short-sighted. And the word short-sighted is saying that this person has... Myopia. Myopia. Anyone here medically inclined knows what myopia is. If you have myopia, you probably know. It's nearsightedness. Nearsightedness. What happens when you can't see far your nearsightedness? You squint, right? Because you're trying to see. That's what this word is meaning. Short-sightedness. You're squinting. It's because literally in myopia, the light is coming into your eyes. And it's refracted in an abnormal way. So you squint and you can't see far away. You can only have vision short for what you see shortly. It's a person who sees the things that are in the world, today's world, but they don't see what's far off in their eternity. They don't see what's far off. They only can see what's right in front of them. They have spiritual myopia. And that spiritual myopia has made them blind. That spiritual myopia has made them blind. Blind to what? The truth of the gospel. The truth of the gospel. So, in opposition to the person who has the qualities and are increasing, this person is lacking the qualities, so much so that they can't even see their future. 
They're spiritually blind because of their myopia, because of their short-sightedness. And not only short-sightedness for the future, but short-sightedness towards the past. This is a person who's been given the gospel. This is a person who's claimed to be Christian. Whether they're saved or not or not, we don't know. But this is a person who has claimed to be a faithful Christian. But they've forgotten. They've forgotten. What does it say here? Their purification from former sins. They've forgotten. The word literally means to be received forgetfulness, to receive forgetfulness. They've forgotten their purification from their former sins. They've been introduced to Christ through the gospel. Maybe they've taken a step forward to be faithful. But now they've either backslidden or they're just not true believers in the first place. That's what this text is saying here. This is a person who's lacking the qualities. They're short-sighted. They can only see this world. They're only concentrating on what's going on here, not on the future. How did they get there? Well, remember how I said the other person got to where they are by reading the scripture and practicing? Well, the blind and short-sighted person was not reading their scripture and practicing. That's how they got there. They closed their eyes to the truth of the gospel. They're squinting. They're trying to see their way towards the future. But those of you who have glasses like I used to, I used to have ones this thick and I had that surgery, that LASIK surgery. But if you have glasses, you know if you're short-sighted and you try to see far away, you start squinting. But guess what? No matter how hard you squint, can you see? Far away? Doesn't matter. It may help just a little bit. But you can't see the future. This is a person who's spiritually squinting. They're trying to see their future without God. But they need corrective lenses. They need corrective lenses. They need God to show the way. The spiritual light of the gospel has come to them. They've seen the light. They have spiritual myopia. They need corrective lenses. They need to hear the gospel again, or they need to act on it. Here's what Paul says in Acts chapter 26. When Christ sent him to the Gentiles, and he was reporting this to others, he said he was sent to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from darkness to light, and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. From darkness to light, from darkness to light, so that they won't squint anymore, so they won't have spiritual myopia, short-sightedness. Unbelievers are completely blind to the truth. Backsliders have forgotten about their future. They've forgotten about their forgiveness of sins. They're concentrating on other things in the world around them. They're concerned with other things. So I ask you, do, are you too concerned with the news? Do you think too much about what's going on in the world today? Or are you thinking about your future? He called us out of darkness from our old selves and into light. Let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 9. He's talking about a people who were not saved originally, the Gentiles. He says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Remember, I told you spiritual myopia. Myopia is a condition where the light comes in, it's refracted in an abnormal way. Don't let the light of the gospel shun you. Don't shut it out. Don't squint. Concentrate on God. Let's turn over to uh, John chapter 3. Verse 19 through 21.
John chapter 3, verse 19 through 21. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. If you don't want to lack the qualities listed in verse 5 through 7 and have spiritual myopia, then practice the things in verse 5 through 7. And I know you're probably thinking, how does that lead me to assurance? How does that lead me to assurance? We're going to get there. So, back to 2 Peter. So this person who lacks these qualities has forgotten or received forgetfulness of his old sins. This is a person who's actively forgotten. They've just shut out the truth of the gospel. They put aside what they cognitively knew, what they knew in their brain to be true. They put those things aside. Their purification of former sins is the result of Christ's blood shed on the cross. That's the only way they can have purification from their former sins. So this person has been introduced to the gospel. They know that it's only by Christ's blood on the cross that you can be clean. They can't see that they're poor and wretched and broken without Christ. If they've blackslidden, they forgot about it. They forgot that only through Christ can you be saved. They're miserable without Christ. They need to be reminded. And that's what Peter says. He says, these things are a reminder to you. That's why he wrote these things in this book. Over to chapter 3 of, first, of 2 Peter, it says this. Chapter 3. This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you in which I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. He's saying, remember the word of God that was spoken to you. That's how you avoid spiritual myopia. Read your Bible and practice it. <laughs> There's some example of the blind people in 2 Peter here. In chapter 2, it says in verse 2, many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. So the false teachers are maligning the way, the way of truth. In uh, verse 19 through 22, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, so they've escaped their sin, they're saved from their sins by the knowledge of Christ, by the gospel knowledge, they are again entangled in them and are overcome. So this is a person who's apostate or backslidden. They've been overcome. They've, they've gone back to their old ways. And then it says the last state has become worse for them than the first. That's not good. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. Wow. It has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit. A sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. A pig in the mud. Just go back to the old thing you used to do. Who wants to do that? I don't want to do that. I know you guys don't want to do that. Let's go over to chapter 3, verse 4. Here's what the false teacher said. This is how they get people into a spiritual myopia. They're saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. They're saying, where is this Jesus? What are you guys talking about? Don't worry about it. Well, does that make you have spiritual myopia and not have your, your sight on the future? Of course, if you listen to it. 
But if you're reading your scripture and you're staying close at hand to the Bible, you can prevent the spiritual myopia and by practicing those things. By practicing those things. Back to uh, chapter 1. Verse 10, therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. There's the answer right there. I told you we were going to get to it. There's the answer. As long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. Those are beautiful words. You'll never stumble as long as you practice these things. Right? Right? So, first of all, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. Remember, we talked about diligence up here in uh, verse 5. Now, for this very reason also, applying all diligence. So, you're supposed to be diligent through your faith to do the fruits of the Spirit in verse 5 through 7. Now, he's saying be even more diligent, (laughs) be even more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. Well, how can you be certain about God's calling and choosing you? How? How is that possible? Well, first of all, what is the calling that he's talking about? He's talking about the divine calling, the effectual calling. The divine effectual calling. Whoever God has called will be his. In Romans 8, I'll switch there. Romans 8. Verse 28, it says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good, to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those who he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. So he called us to be conformed to the image of his son he didn't call us to just sit here and do nothing to be useless and empty and unfruitful no he called us to be conformed to the image of his son now obviously we fall short of that but that's what we were called to do that should be what you strive for to be like christ to be like christ he chose us it says his choosing that's election That's his choosing us before the foundation of the world. Look at verse 29 of the same section. It says, for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed. Predestined. He foreknew. He predestined. This was something God chose to do before the foundations of the earth. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 through 5, it says, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. That's what we've been called for. That's what we've been called for. So be diligent and certain about his calling and choosing. We know what the calling and choosing is. God first elects us, then he calls us to faithfulness, then we obey the things of verse 5 through 7, and then we grow spiritually when we obey those things. And guess what happens after that? We become stronger. We become stronger. We have more confidence and assurance when we practice the things that God has told us to do. We become stronger. We have more assurance by practicing the fruits of the Spirit. And we won't stumble if we do those things. We won't sin. We won't err. Sin is missing the mark. In Jude 24, stumbling refers to Christ Christ keeping the believer from apostasy. From turning away from the faith. We should practice holiness, practice piety, practice the fruits of the Spirit. What happens when we do this? Well, one thing, it makes us more spiritually mature more spiritually mature. So the more you practice the fruits of the Spirit, the more spiritually mature you become. It also makes you more aware of your own weaknesses. When you read Scripture and you practice the fruits of the Spirit, you realize where you're weak, where you need improvement on. It gives you a closer relationship 
with Christ. We all know when we read the scripture, we're closer to Christ. It also makes us rely more on the spirit. Because we're so broken, we realize how broken we are. It makes us say, hey, I can't do this. I need God. So practicing those things gives you more assurance. It's kind of like if you're an athlete and you practice for a sport. It takes a lot of practice to become an Olympian in any sport. A lot of practice. You're not just going to go out there and swim one day and become an Olympic athlete. It takes a lot of practice. And along that practice, what happens? There's bumps in the road. You get some injuries. But you keep going forward. You keep practicing. And what comes, uh, becomes of you in the end? You're a very strong athlete if you've had the discipline and you kept practicing. It's kind of like studying for a test. The more you study for a test, what happens? You become better at knowing the knowledge of the test. And when it comes test time, you can be confident in your test-taking ability. But if you didn't study, what happens when you get to your test? You're not confident. This is what practicing does. Practicing the fruits of the Spirit gives you more assurance. Love, joy, peace, kindness, faithfulness, self-control. The more you do those things, the more assurance you receive. How many of us out there, we say, oh, I'm having a hard time. I don't know what to do. I feel like God's far away. When's the last time you read your Bible? Last year? Go to verse 11. For in this way, when he says in this way, what does he mean? By being diligent, by practicing the things of verse 5 through 7, by not stumbling. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Abundantly supplied to you. I love the word abundantly supplied to you. Well, first of all, let's go back to Verse 5, it says, now for this very reason, applying all diligence in your faith, supply. Supply. He's telling us to do something, to do the fruits of the Spirit. And in the end here, it's interesting because it says what? (laughs) The kingdom of heaven will be supplied to you. Well, who gave you that supply of being able to do the Spirit in the first place, the fruits of the Spirit? God did. You see the big circle here? God gives you the gift of faith. By his own glory and excellence, he's called you. By his glory and excellence. To be more like Christ. Enables you with the Holy Spirit. So that you can supply good deeds prepared beforehand that you can walk in. And in the end, what does he supply? The eternal kingdom. He did the whole thing for you. And what do you need to do? Be obedient to the Spirit's calling you. Be obedient to his word. Be obedient to his word. And he's giving you the ability to do that. And then you'll have more insurance. More assurance. So practicing piety, practicing the fruits of the spirit, the kingdom will be abundantly supplied, overflowing, more than you can even imagine, richly supplied to you. That is assurance. Remember when we started here, we talked about Christ in Christmas. It's after Christmas now. But Christmas keeps going. The gift keeps going. The kingdom is for you. God's abundant supply of grace in verse 3 through 4 is basically saying through Christ and through faith in him, you're supplied with everything you need. It's by faith that we are to supply ourselves, supply ourselves the fruits of the Spirit. By faith, we do that. And in the end, God supplies the believers with the entrance into the eternal kingdom. So, in summary, I encourage you all, if you want to have that blessed assurance that we sang in the song, practice the things of verse 5 through 7, Practice the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Read the scripture. Practice the things you're learning. And in the end, 
God will supply the eternal kingdom to you. I encourage you to do that. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful that you've given us your word and your Holy Spirit so that we may practice the fruits of the Spirit. And Lord, we don't want to be lacking in the fruits. We don't want to backslide, and we don't want to completely be uh, apostate and without uh, your love and care and kindness. And Lord, we're just thankful today that you've given us the ability to practice these things. And we pray that each and every one of us can go out and about our day today and do what we learned. In Christ's name, amen.